LoyMasida.com and who's LoyMasida.com. Today, the date is December 18, 2015. Time right now, 7:35 in the evening. I just wanted to finish off with the um, audiobook review of uh, the brain that changes itself: stories of personal triumph from the frontiers of brain science by Norman Dodgy. Dodgy. I know that's that's what he called himself. He's a Canadian-born psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and the author of *The Brain That Changes Itself*, which was a bestseller, and *The Brain's Way of Healing*. Now, this one was *The Brain That Changes Itself*. The reason I bought this book is because Oliver Sacks, uh, another favorite author of mine, who is also a neuroscientist, he kind of recommended this book highly. And then um, the New York Times, uh, you know, they have kind of uh, applauded this book, saying that. The power of positive thinking finally gained some scientific credibility, mind-bending, miracle-making, really busting stuff. So then I said, okay, I need to read this. Now, you need to understand that I've always been a student of uh, neuroscience, psychology, evolutionary biology, and now, thanks to you know, Dr. Norman Dodgy, I am a fan of neuroplasticity. So first and foremost, who is Norman Dodgy? Uh, he is a Canadian-born psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and the author of uh, this book. Um, you know, what he has done is, is he has kind of researched into a really sensitive area that not many people have uh, much of information. That is, how does the brain respond, especially when there is a massive injury or, like they say, a congenial absence of a sensory organ? Um, so, like, for example, how is it that blind children can suddenly see? How is it deaf can suddenly hear? Um, mostly uneducated people will say, oh, it's a miracle from God or whatever. But here, <clears throat> through uh, fMRI scans, they are able to re reveal which part of the brain responds, why is it happening, and how is it that they can actually, uh, you know, kind of duplicate this result. So now, <clears throat> if you want to be uh, interested in neuroplasticity, plasticity, first you need to ask yourself, like, uh, are you interested in becoming better at, you know, problem solving, learning a new language easily, increasing your ability to focus and uh, get more attention, retaining lost body functions like, <clears throat> let's say you have an accident, a trauma or a stroke, you're paralyzed or you can't see, you can't hear or you have uh, certain abnormalities. How can you cure this without medicine, especially when there's a damage to the brain and the part of your brain is not there? Mostly scientists used to say this is impossible, but now they say it is possible thanks to neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity refers to the potential of the brain that has to recognize and reorganize itself by creating new neural pathways, uh, which kind of adapts to the need of the moment. <clears throat> it's like this. Think, for example, you have a brain, there are certain locations of the brain controlling certain parts of the brain. If this part of the brain, for example, controls the eye, let's say this part of the brain is damaged and it's removed, so how can you control the eye? So what the brain does is, since this part is missing, now it starts using some other part of the brain to control the eye. And how is it that the brain adapts and uh, gets this possible? So this is what, in simple layman's term, uh, this book is all about. Okay. Now, uh, scientists for a number of years had always believed that this was impossible, that the brain had certain key areas that controlled certain key functions. And if that area was damaged or missing, impossible but he kind of proves them wrong what i loved uh, mostly about this book was it was absolutely thought-provoking and it was it made you think like uh, let me give you a few examples example number one uh, a woman had a damage to the inner ears vestibular system that you know kind of senses balance and um, uh, because it was damaged she constantly even if she was standing in the room she would fall down because she didn't have a state of balance and she would uh, you know keep falling down and uh, she had to hold things and even if she was holding something, still she would feel the whole room was shaky. So uh, what they did is uh, sitting in a neuroscience lab, they put a series of electrodes, not to her brain, but to the surface of her tongue and wired it up. And uh, it kind of uh, created an uh, external vestibular system, replacing the damaged part of the brain that was no longer there. And after a few sessions, she no longer needed this machine. She was able to, you know, she even didn't have this uh, this problem anymore. The example number two, a surgeon uh, suffered in his 50s, suffered an incapacitating stroke, whereby I, I think uh, he had uh, one side that was totally paralyzed, an arm and a, a hand that he could not move. So now he, he started teaching himself how he could use that, da uh, replace that damaged part of the brain and use another part of the brain to control 
uh, hand. Uh, he now he plays tennis and uh, you know he's back to normal. Uh, he has learned to even relearn to write. Uh, example number three. Um, uh, this one was pretty interesting. Especially Ramachandran, uh, a very famous uh, neuroscientist, has come over. You can check him out in, uh, um, I think, YouTube. Um, what, what he, Ramachandran, I think, Ram, uh, no, Ramachandran. Uh, let me just get you the name on YouTube. He speaks about uh, your Ramachandran. Okay, yes, Ramachandran, he uses uh, the terminology he calls the phantom arm. It's like, uh, just give, these are my two hands. Uh, let's say, for example, a person has two hands and uh, as he was holding his hand this way, it kind of got uh, cut off. And now, even though the arm is not there, the person feels, the mind is telling him like, why are you holding this hand this way? You need to release. And because he's, he feels that, you know, if you hold your hand tight this way, soon you'll start feeling numbness, you start feeling irritated, you, you want to release your hand. So even though his mind keeps telling him, release your hand, release your hand, there is no hand there. So how is it that you can get rid of the pain of an arm that is not there? So, uh, this, um, you know, this, this gentleman had a 10-year excruciating phantom arm uh, that was cut off from the elbow and how he was able to heal it uh, thanks to, uh, you know, the experiment of uh, using the phantom arm. I, I would recommend you check out the TED Talk of Ramachandran on how he uh, got rid of uh, the phantom arm. Uh, to give you in a nutshell, he just puts a mirror. Uh, the person doesn't have this hand, so he, this mirror box has like three mirrors. He just looks at one side puts this hand so the brain feels he's using actually the other hand and he keeps releasing the hand. So the brain gets the feedback that this hand is moving and it no longer feels the pain or the itch. Example number four, uh, this was my favorite. He talks about uh, the nomadic people, the sea gypsies who live on the tropical uh, west coast of Thailand. Now these people, even before they learn to walk, they are actually swimming and half their lives are on boats and in the ocean and uh, they drive to great depths whereby they don't use oxygen and they are able to breathe even without oxygen for 15-20 minutes. How they are able to do this is their mind is able to control their heart rate so they are able to relax and the most shocking fact is you know if you swim in water with uh, salt water with uh, you know nothing protecting your eyes it kind of irritates and you can't see clearly. They are able to actually control the pupils and dilate it, uh, you know, whereby they can see very clearly, even without uh, glasses or anything, they can see where they're going. So this is a great example of how the mind can control the uh, nervous system. Um, another thing which he focuses on the book is the day-to-day -day impact of neuroplasticity, whereby, you know, people who have ADHD, autism, retardation, and many so-called incurable diseases of the brain can actually benefit by, uh, you know, neuroplasticity. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, he also shows that music, uh, musicians who play stringed instruments have a larger brain map than the normal person because of the active hands. So <clears throat> he also gives another example of uh, taxi drivers who drive in London because uh, they have to buy heart different areas of the streets. They have a larger spatial relationship in their brain where they can formulate uh, and calculate distances much more easily. Even people who meditate, it seems, have uh, such a capacity to you know, develop the brain in larger extents. Um, another thought-provoking fact is people who are deaf, they apparently have uh, increased use of their eyes. Uh, people who are blind have increased use of their ears where they can even calculate sensitive sounds. Um, then finally, the, um, uh, the author moves towards the impact of cultural and personal upbringing, whereby, let's say for example, a six-month-year-old Japanese baby can hear the English sounds of R and L sound distinctly. However, once they become one year old, they can't they can't differentiate between R and L. That is why the Japanese have a different uh, style of pronunciation. So what they say is if you learn a language when you're very young, it's much more easier. However, once you grow up, it becomes hard. So in conclusion, okay, in conclusion of all this book, what he clearly says is like the, <clears throat> the adult brain, many people thought was immutable. It could not uh, change. It had a like clockwork precision. But here what he says is uh, even if, uh, whatever that theory was that, uh, you know, you could not change the rhythm uh, until and if its gears got well, kind of corroded, you cannot use the brain or that part of the senses. He says you can actually, <clears throat> the brain is a lump of clay that you can uh, constantly mold and you can change if you know how to uh, operate it. And the thing is practice makes perfect. But then again, just as, uh, you know, you need to know how to use it. Obviously, you need to know how to use this muscle. And because 
the brain has uh, every argument has two sides the good and bad what he says is um, there is also possibility that people can use this information this knowledge and this technique for uh, you know dark purposes so one should be pretty careful because um, they can be uh, despotic and uh, nationalistic leaders who can uh, you know misuse like Hitler's okay so where is in my uh, website i've kind of put the various chapters i don't want to read them out again overall i give this book a fantastic nine out of ten thought-provoking heavy duty stuff and uh, it it really kept me busy thinking about what i read so that made me kind of believe that uh, maybe you know i you need to use my brain um in ways that can really help me achieve my goal so highly recommend it must read this book and uh, yeah if you do get a ta- chance read this book i suggest it very strongly so live from livemacida.com and it was livemacida.com Giving you his book review, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Dodgy. So, hope you enjoyed the book review. Goodbye for now.